Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about shoulder functional anatomy. Uh, so we're gonna get into a little bit deeper of uh, the anatomy of the structures of the shoulder. And more specifically, we're gonna talk about the relationships between structures and muscles of the shoulder. So the shoulder complex is one of the most complicated structures in the body. Um, I would argue maybe the most complicated musculoskeletal structure of the body. Uh, it includes four joints. Um, and, and those four joints include three separate joint capsules. And then of course the scapulothoracic joint, which is not technically a joint, so it has no joint capsule. Uh, it must provide extensive range of motion in all directions while being precisely controlled. That is no easy task. Um, so the shoulder complex as a whole has to provide the greatest amount of range of motion really of any joint in the whole body. Uh, if you think about how widely um, the whole shoulder complex allows the glenohumeral joint to move um, in every plane and all the planes in between, it's the greatest range of motion of any joint in the body. Um, but we still have to be able to control it with precision. Uh, and that is just not an easy task. So mobility usually comes at the expense of stability as a general rule throughout the body and the shoulder is no exception. So we achieve great mobility in the shoulder complex at the expense of stability. So it's also one of the least stable structures in the body. It lacks the bony and ligamentous stabilizers that are present in most other joints in the body. So most of our other joints have several ligaments that hold them together or the shapes of the bones naturally cause the joints to sort of lock together. Like if we look at the elbow, if we look at the humeral ulnar joint, um, the ulna is sort of hooking around the, the distal end of the humerus. So that's just an example. Uh, so most of our other joints have some sort of bony stabilizing uh, structure or have a bunch of ligaments that help hold things together. Um, the shoulder complex lacks a lot of that. So there are um, still ligaments that do hold the joints together to some extent, uh, but they're little, they're, they're lesser compared to the amount of mobility that the joint allows and therefore the lack of stability that it has. Uh, so stability of the shoulder complex depends heavily on musculature. Okay, so I've used these terms before um, when we're talking about inert structures versus contractile structures. What we're basically saying here is that we don't have a lot of the inert structures that lend stability to the joint that we have in other places. Uh, so we don't have a lot of the, the same ligaments and, and different um, inert structures that help hold the joints together. Uh, so here we're heavily dependent on the function of muscles to, to maintain the stability of the joint. So we're heavily dependent on the contractile structures, so the muscle tendon units. That also means that the shoulder is very vulnerable to muscle imbalances. So if we're depending on all of the muscles of the shoulder to hold everything in place and to allow it to work correctly, all it takes is a hypertonic muscle or two um, or a strength and balance where the muscles on one side are stronger than the others um, to severely affect the movement capabilities of the shoulder. So the bones of the shoulder complex, starting with the sternum, um, so it's part of the axial skeleton. Uh, it's most stable and unmoving of the bones in the shoulder complex. Okay, so we have four bones of the shoulder complex, so the sternum, clavicle, scapula, and humerus. So the clavicle is relatively unmoving, but it's still moving more than the sternum. And the scapula and humerus, of course, are moving dramatically. Uh, so the sternum is the most stable, most stationary, and it's also where the upper extremity technically attaches to the trunk, is at the sternoclavicular joint. So we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, the clavicle forms a strut between the sternum and the scapula. Uh, must elevate and rotate to accommodate movement of the scapula. Okay, so there's less movement of the clavicle than of the other two bones. 
um, but it does have to be able to move. It needs to be able to lift and rotate and move to maintain contact between both the sternum, which is unmoving, and the scapula, which is moving to a great extent. So the clavicle has to be able to move appropriately to maintain its contact and at both joints. Okay, the scapula has no direct bony or ligamentous attachment to the trunk. Um, so again, we describe the relationship between the scapula and the thorax as the scapulothoracic joint, but it isn't technically a joint. So there's actually no um, joint capsule, and there's no ligamentous attachment, there's no direct articulation between bones. Um, there, is, there are layers of muscle that are between the scapula and the ribs. So there's no bony or ligamentous attachment. It attaches to the trunk indirectly through the, through the clavicle. Okay, so the clavicle attaches the scapula to the trunk uh, via the sternum. So as I mentioned a minute ago, the sternum is actually the only site of attachment to the, the body of the entire upper extremity. The humerus, uh, so, the humeral head is retroverted, which means twisted posteriorly from the frontal plane by about 20 to 30 degrees to optimize function in the scapular plane. So what we are saying is that if we look at the humerus and we face, like we look at the distal end and we see all the structures of the distal end and we face them in the anterior direction and we leave it in that orientation and we look all the way up to the top of the humerus, what we'll see is that the humeral head is twisted. It's sort of, I wouldn't want to say rotated because it's like the bone is twisted up at the top of the humeral head and by about 20 to 30 degrees. So although sometimes we think about the humerus as like, like if it's facing anteriorly, the humeral head would be facing medially to attach to the body. Well, it's facing medially but it's also twisted in the posterior direction by about 20 to 30 degrees. It's not completely in the frontal plane. It's not completely pointed in the medial direction. That's because uh, the scapulas are not completely in the frontal plane. Uh, they're angled a little bit on the thorax and we call that the scapular plane. So it's really an oblique plane relative to the frontal plane, the sagittal plane. It's kind of somewhere in between. Um, it's relatively close to the frontal plane, like what we see in this picture here, it's about maybe 30 degrees off, which is why the humeral head is 20 to 30 degrees uh, retroverted, so that it can match the scapular plane, so that it can articulate with the glenoid fossa. So I wanna emphasize, Retroversion of the humeral head is healthy and normal, and we all have it. Um, it can be made more extreme, um, but is still not considered a problem until it's very, very extreme. Um, but like in overhead throwers, in overhead athletes, so like people who are throwing overhead or volleyball players or a number of different types of athletes, uh, they'll have a more, they'll have a greater angle of retroversion in their dominant arm because they are emphasizing that retroversion every time they're going back into that external rotation and then uh, forward into internal rotation. So when they're doing that, they're putting a lot of force through the bone that's emphasizing that retroversion and causing it to become more extreme. So for many of us, depending on how we use our bodies, uh, we might have more or less, we might have more retroversion in our dominant side, and it might be a very big difference if we are like an overhead athlete, for example. Okay, the sternoclavicular joint is the only attachment of the shoulder girdle to the axial skeleton, which I don't know about you, but it kind of blows my mind if you really think about that, is that we have this whole upper extremity that is only attached to the trunk via this one little joint right here in the front. So it's the only attachment of the whole shoulder girdle to the, um, to the rest of the skeleton uh, because the humerus is just articulating with the scapula and the scapula technically isn't articulating with anything. So we're really depending on musculature and the sternoclavicular joint to hold the entire upper extremity in place. Uh, the sternoclavicular joint is inherently incongruent. 
What we mean by that, anytime we call a joint incongruent or congruent, we're talking about how well the bones fit together. So the better the bones fit together, just based on their shape, really, the shape and size of the bones, um, the better they fit together, the more we would say it's congruent. Um, to say that the sternoclavicular joint is inherently incongruent, we're saying that the bones just aren't shaped to fit well together. Um, the sternal extremity of the clavicle projects above its attachment at the manubrium. So it's inherently incongruent. They just, by design, don't actually fit together very well. Um, but even so, it is an incredibly strong joint, very difficult to dislocate. Um, so in most cases where there's a strong enough force, we're more likely to fracture the clavicle than we are to actually dislocate the sternoclavicular joint. Now, it still can be dislocated, and we'll talk about that in a future lecture. Um, so it still can be dislocated, but we are actually more likely to fracture the clavicle than dislocate it because it is so incredibly strong. Okay, the acromioclavicular joint, uh, the, it must move to maintain contact between the scapula and clavicle. Okay, so as I mentioned a minute ago, the clavicle has to maintain contact with the sternum, which is not moving on one end, and the scapula, which is moving a lot on the other end. So the, scap or the clavicle has to be able to move to a pretty good extent, to a pretty great extent, to maintain its connection at both joints. Um, so at the chromioclavicular joint, we need to have a good amount of mobility so that we can maintain that connection. Uh, so the acromioclavicular joint has this very small joint capsule like we see in the picture here. It's only that small little bit right where we're connecting the end of the clavicle to the acromion process of the scapula. Uh, it's also supported by the acromioclavicular ligament and the coracoclavicular ligament. Um, so those are those extra ligaments we see in the picture here that are attaching between the coracoid process of the scapula and the clavicle. Um, so although the joint only includes that little capsule off to the side, the joint is stabilized by these additional ligaments that help kind of anchor uh, between the um, scapula and clavicle so that we don't have too much movement and all of the forces of movement of the clavicle are not completely only uh, being absorbed by the joint capsule of the chromioclavicular joint. Okay, the scapula thoracic joint, as I've mentioned a hundred times now, uh, it's not technically a joint. It doesn't fit into any of our anatomical classifications of joints. So it isn't one, although we do discuss it as though it is because we need a way to discuss its actions. Uh, so the scapula moves to accommodate and augment the movement of the AC and SC joints, which move to accommodate and augment movement at the glenohumeral joint. So really we can think of all three joints of the shoulder that we've talked about so far as really just being there to facilitate healthy, normal movement with full range of motion of the glenohumeral joint. Okay, so all four joints of the shoulder are all just working to the end of the glenohumeral joint having adequate function. <clears throat> All right, the glenohumeral joint has a very shallow articular surface. So the glenoid fossa is extremely shallow. Uh, there is not a very large surface to articulate with there, and it's not very deep. Uh, we talk about a ball and socket, and that sort of makes you envision like an actual socket, like an actual cupping uh, structure, but it really isn't in the shoulder. It's just a very small, shallow surface as the glenoid fossa. Uh, so it has very shallow articular surfaces, relatively loose ligamentous support because it's got to allow for a very wide range of motion and a loose joint capsule for the same reason. So because all of those inert structures are relatively loose to allow for a lot of mobility and we have a very small area to actually form the articulation, uh, we're extremely dependent on the dynamic support of our contractile tissue, the muscle tendon units. 
Uh, so movement of the other three joints of the shoulder complex occurs to facilitate accurate movement of the glenohumeral, which means that dysfunction at any of our shoulder joints will all affect the glenohumeral joint. Okay, so injury or dysfunction at any of our four um, shoulder complex joints will affect our range of motion or um, some other type of function in the glenohumeral joint. Okay, the glenoid labrum is a ring of fibrocartilage that somewhat deepens the socket, and I put that in quotes because it's not much of a socket, of the glenoid fossa and slightly increases the articular surface. Okay, so the glenoid fossa is very small and very shallow, um, but it has the glenoid labrum, which is a ring of fibrocartilage that basically increases the amount of surface area there is to form the articulation, and it makes it a little bit more socket shaped. It makes it a little bit more rounded to articulate better and be more congruent uh, with the head of the humerus. With that said, it's still not a lot of surface area. It's still not very deep. It's still pretty shallow, um, but it does improve things. Okay, the coracochromial arch <clears throat> is formed by the coracochromial ligament. Um, so they're kind of one and the same. The coracochromial ligament, we also refer to as the arch. Um, so it goes from the inferior acromion process to the posterior coracoid process. Protects the superior humeral head, rotator cuff tendons, and various bursae from trauma. Okay, so we've got this ligament that goes across um, between the two structures there, between the two processes of the scapula. And then there are a whole bunch of things that are underneath that, that are between the glenohumeral joint and that arch. Okay, so they're superior to the glenohumeral joint and inferior to the arch, kind of sandwiched underneath. So we'll talk about more, that more when we talk about injuries of the shoulder. Uh, so there's the subacromial bursa. It's above the superior surface of the supraspinatus tendon. Um, and its job is to lubricate the movement of the overlying fibers of the deltoid muscle and also lubricate movement of the other structures that are also located in that space. Okay, glenohumeral movement. When the humerus is hanging at rest in anatomical position, the head of the humerus has very little contact with the glenoid fossa. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the ligamentous support and the joint capsule are pretty loose for the glenohumeral joint to allow for a great amount of mobility. So when we're just at rest and the arm is hanging by your side, the, there really isn't contact between the glenoid fossa and the head of the humerus. So there's a little bit of a, a gap because of the weight of the extremity. Most of the weight of the upper extremity is supported by the superior glenohumeral ligament and the inferior glenoid labrum. Okay, so the light blue part in this picture here, that's the superior glenohumeral ligament that is really carrying a lot of the weight of the upper extremity when we're at rest and it's just hanging by your side. Uh, that plus also the inferior uh, glenoid labrum also carries a lot of that force. When the humerus is abducted to 90 degrees and externally rotated, the entire joint capsule is wound tightly. That's its closed packed position. So every joint has a closed packed position. And by that, we mean the position where the bones are the most congruent and the joint capsule is pulled the most taut. So it's the position where the joint is the most stable because the bones fit together the best and the capsule is pulled taut, so it's, it's a lot less lax. Um, so it's the most stable, but it's also the position where we're most vulnerable to injury because we have less, um, we have less movement available there. So like if someone's in the closed packed position and a large force goes through that joint, they're more likely to be injured by it than if they were in a different position. Um, because there, there isn't enough sort of flexibility and movement in the joint in that position to be able to cope with and absorb those forces in a healthier way. Um, so in the glenohumeral joint, the closed pack position is 90 degrees abducted and externally rotated, which if you look at what I'm doing and think about what that really is, that's what we do in an overhead 
throw or in a lot of overhand movements in different sports. When we wind up, we start with that abduction and external rotation. And that's why overhead athletes or overhand throwing, volleyball, all kinds of sports like that, um, that's why they are more vulnerable and more prone to certain uh, glenohumeral injuries is because they're frequently putting large forces through the joint as they're moving fast into the closed pack position and then out again. And then especially like um, if a force, like, like let's say it's in football and they wind up to throw it and then get tackled, now that joint is in an especially vulnerable position and is less able to cope with those forces and they'll be more vulnerable to injury in that state. Uh, scapula humeral rhythm is a term meaning the coordination between the scapula and humerus during glenohumeral movement. Okay, so that's a commonly used term that uh, is used in research and textbooks and clinically. Um, and it's important because we need the, the uh, scapula to be able to move rhythmically with the movement of the humerus. If the scapula is moving incorrectly, when the humerus needs it to move correctly, uh, then it's gonna cause abnormal movement or dysfunction at the glenohumeral joint. Uh, so just as one little example, if I abduct my glenohumeral joint, I can only make it to about 90 degrees or so before I also need my scapulas to upwardly rotate to accommodate more abduction. If my scapulas can't upwardly rotate for whatever reason, then my range of motion and abduction of the glenohumeral will be restricted. Um, so it's important that the, the scapula is not only able to move in all directions, but it's also important that it moves appropriately at the appropriate times when the glenohumeral needs it to move in certain directions. Okay, so muscles of the shoulder are grouped into two, two groups. Um, so we have the muscles that act on the scapula and the muscles that act on the glenohumeral joint. Okay, so all of those muscles are going to ultimately affect the function of the entire uh, shoulder girdle. So the scapular muscles must control the orientation of the glenoid fossa to allow the shoulder complex increased range of motion. So really all of the motion of the scapula is to orient the scapula or to orient the glenoid fossa correctly so that the humerus can move in whatever way it needs to move. So the scapula is just moving to move the glenoid fossa in whatever direction it has to go so that the entire glenohumeral joint can move and shift in whatever direction it needs to to accommodate full range of motion. It must stabilize the scapula to provide a stable base of support for glenohumeral muscles during contraction. Okay, so on top of needing to be able to move to accommodate the movement at the glenohumeral joint, it also needs to be a stable place for all of the many muscles of the glenohumeral joint that also attach to the scapula. Uh, so of course, not all muscles that cross the glenohumeral also cross the, or also attach to the scapula. Of course, that's not the case. Um, but many do, several do. Uh, we have 11 muscles that cross the glenohumeral joint, and of those, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I can think of seven off the top of my head that do, maybe it's more than that. Um, so many of them attach to the scapula and then cross the glenohumeral joint. Um, and so it's important that the scapula be able to maintain its uh, solid stable position so that when those muscles that cross the glenohumeral joint shorten that they're lifting up on the humerus instead of pulling down on the scapula. Uh, glenohumeral muscles, as I just mentioned, there are 11 that cross the glenohumeral joint. We're not going to get into all of them because we've done that in past lectures, uh, but just a few to mention here. Um, so during later stages of abduction, Okay, so as we're getting higher and higher up into abduction, not only does the scapula have to upwardly rotate to accommodate that, but we also need to pull the humeral head down so that it can clear the acromion process. Okay, so as we're lifting up and up and up and up, the humeral head has a tendency, it wants to just go up and up and up. And if it did that, it would crush, it would cr um, 
crash into the acromion process and that would restrict our range of motion. So instead, we have the rotator cuff muscles as a group that are producing a downward pull to pull the head of the humerus in the inferior direction so that as we abduct, the humeral head is coming down and can clear the acromion process. Uh, the long head of the biceps brachii originates at the supraglenoid tubercle on the scapula and the superior portion of the glenoid labrum. Okay, so um, we have the glenoid labrum that is sitting on the glenoid fossa and right at the very superior tip of the glenoid fossa, we have a little bump called the supraglenoid tubercle. So what we're saying is that the long head of the biceps originates at that little bump at the tip of the uh, glenoid fossa and that portion of the superior labrum that's on top there. Uh, then the tendon passes through the bicipital groove, which is anchored by the transverse humeral ligament, which we see in the picture here. Okay, so the long head of the bicep goes from the top of the glenohumeral joint over the top and then comes down into that bicipital groove or intertubercular groove, you'll also hear it called because it's between the tubercles. And then it's anchored in that space by the transverse humeral ligament. So I mention that here because it will be important in a future lecture when we talk about injuries and pathologies of the glenohumeral joint. Okay, so that is all I have for you in this lecture. Thank you for watching.